Hello, everyone, and welcome to the industry panel, Benefits and Challenges of DMARC. My name is Shazad Mirza. I'm the Director of Operations at Global Cyber Alliance. In this panel, we do have obviously a few panelists that will present and give their views on the benefits and challenges of DMARC that they have faced while going through the process and give some you know, implementation guides and some information as well. Uh, but before we get started, uh, I'll just give a brief introduction of DMARC and again, just as a reminder, if you do have any questions, please pose those questions in the questions box that is available to you in your GoToWebinar control panel. So again, just as a reminder what DMARC is. So DMARC stands for Domain-Based Message Authentication, Reporting, and Conformance. And it's an, basically an identity check for your organization's email domain name. By creating a DMARC and implementing a DMARC policy, you're basically protecting and preventing others from using your email domain. So there's going to be two parts to DMARC. There's going to be the DMARC policy, which allows the sender to indicate that their messages are being protected by, very, by two specific authentication mechanisms. So that's what the sender side is going to create. On the receiving side, you're going to need to have a DMARC verification capabilities and that DMARC verification mechanism is going to check for the sender's DMARC policy to see what to do with a message if one of those authentication mechanisms were to fail. Should it put it into the junk folder? Should it completely drop the message? Or should it just let the message pass through? So we have three panelists here today. And thank you again to all the panelists that, have, that are attending this and presenting for us. And they're going to talk about the benefits and challenges that they have seen for DMARC. So the first panelist is going to be Tony Krzyzewski. He's worked in information systems for over 41 years with the past 23 years specializing in cybersecurity. He is a member of the New Zealand Information Security Standards Advisory Group and is a national expert and voting member on the ISO 27000 Information Security Standards Committee. He's also contributed to the development of CIS Controls version 7 due to the release, due to release in 2018. And this year, he has been made fellow of the New Zealand Institute of IT Professionals for his 40 plus year contribution to the IT industry. After Tony, we'll have Gino Kosquis from Redshift. He has been involved with many companies in Europe in the telecom, media, and e-commerce sectors, helping them build propositions and drive adoption and high usage of their products and services. He's worked with many companies in different sectors to drive the adoption of DMARC protocol as a fundamental security implementation, and he's also an avid investor in technology companies. And then lastly, we have Chris Grunderman. He uh, is well over a decade of experience as both a network engineer and solution architect design, building and operating large IP, Ethernet, and wireless Ethernet networks. He's written two books, eight patents, and has given talks in five different continents. In his current role as principal architect at Myrid Supply, he is helping clients build bigger, faster, and more efficient IT infrastructure that is easier to operate and scale. So those are all of our panelists. And so we'll go ahead and jump right in and start off with Tony. Hello. Um, thank you for attending. Um, it's perhaps important to understand how we manage to turn email, an essential part of any business environment and a core part of many of our personal lives into the most commonly used internet attack precursor mechanism. It's often stated that phishing attacks are the precursor to ransomware attacks in over 90% of cases. So how did we get it wrong? The internet as we know it was born in November 1977 when the first internet work connection was made. This fledgling internet work primarily used the United States Defense Department ARPANET network and because the underlying infrastructure was secure, little consideration was made with regard to security of the transmission protocols. By September 1981, the internet protocol had developed sufficiently that internet protocol version four, that's the version that most of the world uses today, was released. IP version four, at the time of its release in 1981, had no inherent security specification and remains that way for much of the traffic transmitted over the internet today. In 1982, the specification for the Simple Mail Transport Protocol, or SMTP, was released, again without any security specification. 
Some changes were made to the SMTP protocol in 2008, but fundamentally, the 1982 Simple Mail Transport Protocol is still the means by which the world's email systems exchange information. It is now possible to secure the transmission of email across the internet using encryption, but this only prevents the interception of information in transit. It's not used all the time, and it does not fix a fundamental flaw that has been there in SMTP since inception. The flaw lies within the from field. This flaw makes it possible to easily change the content of the from field to anything the sender likes, and the underlying transport system will still deliver the message. It is this from field vulnerability that first led to the rise of spam, and then later on <coughs> to the massive growth in phishing attacks. These spammers and phishing attackers simply change the from field to make it look like the email is coming from a valid source and then send the email out. <coughs> we are now in a situation in 2017 where our email communications are using a 35-year-old insecure email protocol together with a 36-year-old insecure transmission protocol over an inherently insecure network. So why didn't we just fix SMTP, you may ask? The challenge here is that the world is so dependent upon the core SMTP protocol that we can't simply switch to a new email system. The only thing we can do now is append controls to help resolve the inherent vulnerabilities. Over the years, a number of things have been done to help the situation. Send a policy framework was the first step. Now we're 11 years old, SPF is a simple system that allows email receivers to check that incoming email is being received from a mail server authorized to send email on behalf of a specific domain. Domain Keys Identified Mail, DKIM, takes this one step further by adding an encrypted key to outbound email, which the email receiver can validate against a public key held within the organization's public DNS records. The real breakthrough comes with DMARC, which uses SPF and DKIM and then adds specific instructions to email receivers as to how to handle email that doesn't pass the SPF and DKIM checks. With over 85% of consumer email accounts in the United States and 70% across the globe capable of now being protected by DMARC, it's now the turn of business, government, local government and any other organization sending email under their own domain name to do their part. I've been involved with email security since the late 1990s and in the past have run email filtering systems for businesses, local governments and central government. Trying to block spam has always been a challenge. Techniques have varied over the years from basic blacklisting, the use of Bayesian logic to compare outbound and inbound traffic, and even down to tools that block specific words. The advent of hostile phishing attacks has made the requirement to block undesirable content even more important. We run our own in-house mail system using Karyo Connect Mail Server. This server has the ability to decom sign outgoing messages, but quite quickly I discovered a challenge when we tried to implement decom. Karyo has an inbuilt decom key that is 2048 bits long. It's the maximum length currently supported. My challenge came when I tried to input that key into a text field within our external DNS service, which is provided by one of New Zealand's larger DNS providers. After some to and fro with their support team, it was determined that the reason why I could not add a 2048-bit DKIM key was that their DNS system can only handle 256 characters within a text field. That's enough for a 1024-bit key, but not enough for a 2048-bit key. I've subsequently discovered this is not an uncommon problem. Luckily, there are cloud-based services that can generate 1024-bit keys, so I used one of these, replaced the 2048-bit private key within Karyo Connect, then regenerated my public key, put that key into our DNS records and published out to the world. Great! Outbound mail from the office was DMARC enabled. But, we also run our Sanford compliance system as a web app in the Azure cloud hosting service. Built into the Sanford compliance application is an SMTP service to issue task and action emails to users, 
as well as for supporting the user authentication process. The SMTP handler within the application doesn't support DKIM signing, so we had a choice. Either rebuild the SMTP handler process to support DKIM, or look for an alternative solution that could handle both the office email DKIM signing and the web application DKIM signing. We found the answer in SendGrid. The SendGrid service has the ability to take over DKIM signing on behalf of email domains. We found this very easy to set up with only a few DNS entries being required for each email domain being protected by DMARC. We now send email from the office and from the web application into SendGrid via an encrypted email session and SendGrid does everything else for us. SendGrid appends our DKIM key, the emails go out to the client ready to be DMARC filtered by the recipient's email service. DMARC gives us the confidence that not only are our email domains being protected, but also that our client emails relating to service delivery are actually being delivered. The DMARC reporting email volumes we were seeing initially were reasonably low and could be checked manually. As these have risen, we've now moved to reporting over to the DMARC checking and reporting service on DMARC, which is making life much easier for us. For us as a business, DMARC is an absolutely essential part of our business operations. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Next will be Gino. Hello, uh, I'm Gino Gogis from Redshift. Um, I work with a number of organizations in the private and public sector in, in Europe, and uh, there are three main reasons why we have seen um, people uh, implementing the, the DMARC protocol, and, and, and those are key things to be able to protect your domain. The first one is around visibility, uh, the second one deliverability, and the third one protection. Uh, and I'm going to uh, pass to explain um, uh, each one of these areas. So the first one, uh, regarding visibility, uh, what the DMARC protocol gives you is the possibility to know who is using your domain to send emails today. So it's not uh, about a perceived risk, but current risk and knowing you know, exactly who in the world and, and which is the volume of, of emails that are being impersonated at the moment uh, using your domain. Um, it also allows you to understand which of your current sending services are properly configured and which are, are not uh, correctly configured. Uh, the second part is deliverability. So once you have all your legitimate services configured, the chance of those emails, of bulk marketing emails or, or automatic uh, operational emails sent to a, to a destinatory, the chance of those emails getting to the inbox instead of a spam folder is, is, is much higher because the receiving servers will be able to understand that those emails have passed DMARC, have, has passed FPS, SPF, and have passed um, DKIM. So they are more, much more likely to be um, legitimate emails um, from a legitimate um, uh, origin. Uh, so those are treated in that way and sent into the inbox of the, of the receiver. And the third part is, is protection. So once you have all those email services uh, configured, you can move to a particular policy that, that, that is in the, in the DMARC protocol that is called reject, that allows you to, to say to the world and to receiving servers, um, if you receive an email that doesn't pass DMARC validation, that doesn't pass SPF and the KIM um, from my domain, uh, please bin those, eliminate those emails, don't present it to a user in any way. And so those are the, the, one, the, the three main reasons for implementing the protocol, you know, visibility, knowing who sends emails from your domain, deliverability, and protection. Uh, just in terms of uh, particular experiences with, with, different, um, uh, with different organizations, um, I would like to start with, with the fact that the DMARC protocol is the only measure that can effectively protect your domain and block other people from sending emails on your behalf. So most of the solutions that you're going to see out there uh, that are implemented within the cyber perimeter of an organization, namely anti-phishing solutions or even procedures, um, are work within the, the perimeter of, of, of such organization. They don't work outside. So if someone somewhere in the world wants to send an email from your domain, using your domain, to someone else in another organization, the only thing that will protect uh, your brand and your reputation online and will block those emails is the DMARC protocol. At the same time, uh, DMARC is not the silver bullet for all anti-phishing. Anti-phishing is a very broad problem and it's important to have a comprehensive you know, list of, of things in the form of uh, you know, training, procedures, 
um, an anti-phishing anti solutions and the DMAR protocol. Um, all of these working together to give you kind of, kind of a more solid um, uh, and, and deficient, particularly depending on the size of the organization, it's important to have a kind of a comprehensive solution uh, uh, against um, uh, against uh, phishing. Um, this is this is similar as in any security implementations. There is not one thing that will protect you against against everything. You have to look into a number of um, a number of uh, uh, policies and, and implementations. Some of them are already embedded in the in the in, in the solutions that you already uh, have. Uh, some of them are procedures that are that are that you may have already in place. Some of them you need to look at the, them specifically. Um, what we have seen in most organizations that that, that, that we have worked with is that around 20 to 30 percent of the emails sent from a particular domain are fake emails. Are impersonation emails, and this this doesn't depend necessarily on the size of the organization. We have seen even smaller accounts, smaller companies that have um, have big percentages of impersonation. So some some people may think, you know, I'm, I own a small domain, um, I don't send a lot of emails, so very unlikely that I don't that I'm sending emails on your behalf. So one thing that, that we that we can be sure of is that uh, is that a domain, if it's if it's out, if it's online. And it's used for uh, for phishing. Uh, particularly, I can speak uh, about one one of my uh, personal domains. When I implemented DMARC and I could see all all the all the reports of the emails that are being sent from my domain, I found out that most of the emails sent from that domain were impersonation emails. So around two or three emails per day were sent by me, and then around um, uh, you know many more, seven to nine in a in a normal day where um, unauthorized emails from all over the world, different different places, different locations, uh, people that were finding a domain that uh, that had a high ranking that was not blacklisted anywhere, and they were using that domain to try to send emails on your behalf, on my behalf. Uh, once I put the reject policy, all those emails from different uh, unauthorized sources were uh, were blocked, and at the moment they keep they keep happening and they keep being blocked. Um, one final thing uh, uh, to mention. Uh, so just just in terms of like the protocol itself. So the DMAR protocol is free to implement, and there are a number of resources to implement it. Uh, the smaller the company, or the earlier you start with implementing the protocol, the easier it is. And using um, a free tool for a small organization, it makes it very easy for uh, to, to to implement it, the protocol. Just one thing to mention is that even though uh, there are also some paid tools, some of them have free tiers for small organizations like let's say you know um, um, a sole trader a coffee shop some some companies with with a smaller domain that are, that are sending a small volume of emails um, some providers have uh, free tiers where you can use like the full set of a, of a product uh, for, for for free or for a very low uh, price when organizations start getting a little bit more complicated in terms of their email infrastructure and the number of email and cloud services that send emails on their behalf um, you may reach to a point where uh, where it it may be easier and cheaper to use um, a paid tool to to get to uh, to to reject mode. And as more complicated it gets, it, it basically is imperative to use a tool like that. Um, finally, if you own any domains that you're not sending emails from, uh, domains that are only websites and, and nobody's sending emails from, or that you have parked, that you have separated. Uh, just to make sure that you own those domains, that you own the trademark and the brand of, of, of uh, in, in different other uh, countries or other um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, domains or similar names of those domains. You can park those domains, put an exclusive SPF record, and put a DMARC record in reject, so nobody can send emails from from those domains. Let's say you own a .com domain, and then you also have like the .co.uk or the .es for Spain or the .it for Italy. You can grab all the other domains that you don't send emails from and park them and block them from third, third parties to being able to send emails from, from those domains. And uh, back to Shesha, that's me. Thank you, Gino. And our next panelist is going to be Chris Grunderman. Hi, yes, thank you, Shad. Uh Tony and Gino did a great job of kind of doing an overview of the, the, the technical basis for uh, DMARC and a lot of the, the, you know, the benefits and the questions and concerns. There's a couple of, I guess what I would call triads that I'd really like to reinforce and, and, and restate. Um, again, I think the first one is the, the benefits. Uh, obviously, you know, 
many of the benefits come around uh, spam and phishing. Um, and I think you know one of the great things is if you use DMARC to sign your emails, you're really taking control of your brand and ensuring that no one can spoof you know your domain and send emails from your domain. Uh, as was mentioned, there's all the you know potential options of, of kind of getting around that with the misspellings and, and domains that kind of look the same. Um, but at least you know the domains that you have registered that you have control over. Uh, you do extend that control into the email space, and I think that's very valuable um, from a marketing perspective, from a branding perspective, and from a trust uh, perspective with your customers and, and partners. Uh, the second piece is the uh, ability to kind of stop the phishing and spam attacks that come into your organization. So um, ensuring that email that you receive only comes from you know sources that are that are validated through the system, the same way that you are taking control of your email going out uh, under your domain uh, and your uh, you know your brand and your name. Uh, others are doing the same, and as long as you are, you know, looking at that and um, making taking some kind of action based on that, uh, then you're protecting, you know, your uh, employees and and folks who are getting email on your domain um, from receiving, uh, you know, obviously uh, forged messages. I think that's a, that's a huge value. And then the third piece is the visibility, uh, which allows you to really kind of coupled onto that taking control of your email, really seeing, you know, who's sending email from your domains, what's going out, what's coming in. Uh, and really understand that landscape in a way that it's it's really hard to do in, in any other way. Um, so those are, I think that's kind of the the benefit triad there. And then as far as deploying DMARC, I think there's kind of um, uh, you know from a high level the three step process to, to get it done. Um, you know we work with many many, many clients uh, throughout New York and, and around the world uh, who have done this. And I think the you know the really high level steps are to first start with your outbound email. Make sure you've deployed email authentication uh, across all outbound email, and of course, uh, as was mentioned um, by Tony, that requires you know the SPF and the DKIM records being there first, and then you can you know enable DMARC to deploy that uh, outbound email authentication, so the receivers can identify legitimate mail from you, um, and that's kind of the first step there. And then the second step is. Uh, checking email authentication for inbound email, right? So looking at the stuff that's coming towards you, making sure that folks are, you know, reducing their risk and reducing your risk uh, in turn, both through those spear phishing and and other uh, attacks that could lead to data loss or or anything else. And then the third step, which I think gets overlooked a lot, is um, requiring your partners to adopt email authentication, right? This is one of those things where the more people who are doing it, the better it works for everyone. Uh, and so the more pressure you can put on you know, companies you, you buy from or, or get services from uh, or even your own customers, um, if you can you know, push, um, require maybe a hard, hard word, um, but, uh, but you know, push and suggest uh, and evangelize the use uh, of DMARC and email authentication to the folks you work with, uh, the other organizations that you work with on a regular basis, um, the faster this spreads and, and the more secure and safe the email system becomes. So I am going to unmute all the panelists and at this point we're going we have uh, we're going to open this up to questions that people have so if there's any questions that folks have please feel free to put up those or post those questions using the questions uh, box that's available into your in your control panel and uh, we will get those questions to the panelists right now and hopefully get you answers to what you are looking for so here's one question that's going up to Pete. So the question here, Pete, is apparently only 19 of 43 police forces in England and Wales has DMARC deployed, most in monitoring mode. What challenges have you identified that is preventing full deployment across all forces? Would be legacy systems, infrastructure, resources, funding, and how could you how could you potentially help influence further deployment? That's a very good question. Um, it's an interesting one, and I guess we're not unique in the UK policing market. I suspect uh, in the States as well, it's very much, there's a number of different organizations or departments all responsible for their own in infrastructure. I think we've got a challenge to basically work together and share best practice, I'd say, around getting DMARC in. We've also obviously got some concerns around using cloud services. We want to make sure that our emails get out to the right people from various cloud services. But we also want to make sure that we're protecting ourselves from malicious use of those emails, uh, email addresses uh, across, the, across the cloud provider. 
I'd imagine with some of the bigger companies, they'll be fairly rigid in their policies, in internal procedures, etc. But you could imagine a situation where if a particular provider is allowed to send email on your behalf, does that mean that all employees could potentially do it if they got hold of a mail server or an SMTP tool? Does it mean that that company's partners can do it? Uh, what about other customers in the hosting environment? So to me that's a big challenge. We've got to balance the infosec side of things with the project side of things, making sure that we can send our emails out um, securely and balance the risk around the misuse of email. So the next question here is from one, one uh, listener here is saying that it's not clear enough. So why, why go with DMARC? Why not just use SPF and DKIM separately? So I'll, I'll start with uh, Gino. Um, SPF uh, helps you publish a list of IP addresses that are authorized to send emails on your behalf, and the key is an encrypted signature. None of those two measures, those two measures will give you um, an idea of an email uh, being valid or not, but none of those two measures enforce the uh, elimination and, and deletion of a fake email. So DMARC comes to close the loop on the security side and builds on those two, two markers, SPF and the Kim, and tells the receiving server, if that email that you just received doesn't pass SPF and the Kim, you need to eliminate it. Don't send it to the spam folder, don't, don't, don't present it into a user, just completely eliminate it. That's, that's, a, uh, that's the beauty of, uh, of DMARC. Thank you. Uh, Tony and Pete, do you wish to add anything? No, yeah, I, just read um, I think, sorry, sorry. sorry. First. <laughs> I was going to say, um, I just um, really, it's, it's all about the, the DMARC reporting. It's been able to see where your email is used, not just um, stopping people from misusing it. Uh, the reports are really powerful, especially if you plug them into one of the free or paid for tools that are available on the internet. I think the real important thing here is, the, is that close of the loop that Gino mentioned. Um, the SPF and DKIM by themselves don't actually enforce anything. Um, only by adding DMARC in there are we completely blocking things. A really good example is Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs in the United Kingdom. They put DMARC in and they're actually now to a full reject stage. They have eliminated half a billion emails sent under their domain name from the internet. That's an awful lot of phishing attacks removed from the planet. And that's the real benefit. We're actually adding control back into the system. All right, thank you. So yeah, it's a, and I agree with all the panelists. I mean, just to add to it as well, just to reiterate what Pete said too, the reporting part is also really important. With SPF and DKIM alone, you don't have the reporting capability. And DMARC is going to give you that reporting capability so you know what's happening with SPF and you know what's happening with DKIM as well as DMARC. Next question is, uh, so going back a bit to what uh, Peter was talking about with the law enforcement and uh, so on, uh, Tony, this question is for you. Have you, uh, do you have a view on similar challenges to deployment across public and private sectors in the New Zealand, Australia region? Um, really for us, it's an education campaign. Um, it's interesting, DMARC's been around for quite a few years um, and we've actually seen the implementation on the receiver side done very, very well within the likes of Microsoft, uh, Google, Yahoo Mail, but not a lot's been done on the sender side. So getting the message out has been the, is the real challenge. DMARC's not that hard to implement. It just requires a, 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 a real desire to do it and, and make the difference. So that's, that's where we're, we're coming from here. Um, and it's been really great with Global Cyber Alliance to, that we can get the message across um, and people are listening. Um, I might actually have a meeting with central government in about 48 hours to talk about it. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> a few other questions are, so what concerns, if any, did you have about DMARC initially? So before even just getting doing the process or going through the, DM, the implementation, before even considering DMARC, what are, you know, what are some of the concerns that you, had, you may have had? Uh, let's start with Pete. Yeah, um, it was about probably about six months ago we were asked to start looking into SDF and DMARC and I, I think we should have probably known about it sooner but it's one of these things where you look after so many different systems that you sometimes 
miss out on the key bits of information, uh, the key requirements. And to be fair, I think the government probably should have told us to do it sooner as well. Um, but for me personally, it was a lack of knowledge about the, the facilities. I've obviously heard of SPF, I had a reasonable understanding of what it did, but DMARC and DKIM was a little bit new uh, in my knowledge and trying to implement something internally without bringing down all of our outbound emails was a little bit concerning. But with resources on the internet and with a lot of help from Global Cyber Alliance we've got there, it wasn't that complicated, but it's just something that you need to give a bit of time to and um, spend a bit of time on it. And really, it's looking back, apart from the issues with the DNS key, it wasn't too difficult to achieve. We're moving now into quarantining and I think it will be a case of looking at um, gradually ramping that up. And the emails will end up in people's spam folders, which isn't too much of an issue. They'll know not necessarily to trust it as a result. And then obviously the longer term we can block stuff. But we've done all the hard work, I think. It's just a case of pushing that quarantine up now. Right, thank you. Uh, Tony, do you have anything to add? Yeah, the, this, this phased approach is important. I mean, I, 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 we have just gone to quarantining, and um, you, there has to be a bit of faith there to say, yes, I, we're willing to start saying, if something comes from somewhere not authorized by ourselves, we quarantine. And having a few months of just monitoring first, and then finally switching over is important. So this is a phased implementation. It's not something you just go, we're on, we're going to start rejecting. It's, it is a management process, and you need to develop systems in-house to say, let's just monitor to begin with. How long are we going to monitor for? Then slowly ramp up the quarantining. And then when you've got total confidence that you, all of your systems are working well, um, everything's uh, in place, then we can turn the reject on, and then DMARC's done properly. OK. So another thing that we've noticed that each of the panelists, that each of you has spoken up and seem to have stressed a lot is about reporting. Um, so Gina, we'll start with you on this part. I mean, so why, why is reporting so important to the DMARC process? Yes, so the reporting part of DMARC or the reporting capability of DMARC is, uh, it has two parts. One of them is it will give you aggregate reports of all the emails that have been sent using your domain, the legitimate ones and the, and the illegitimate ones, and the, and the results of the validation that was done of those emails um, with, your, with your SPF and the Kim and DMARC um, configurations. The second part is the forensic reports. So four domains, four emails that um, have failed validation, some receiving servers will send a bit more detail on the, uh, on the email, including the, uh, uh, the sender and the, and the subject of the email that will help you um, triage and, and hone further your, your configuration. So the main thing is that it, it is important to know who is sending emails on your behalf. And in some, in some organizations, particularly um, local authorities in the UK, we see that a number of organizations within the remit um, send emails on their behalf, like you know, some local schools, some charities, some libraries. And the reporting mechanism allows them to map out everyone who's sending emails on their behalf and then decide which are the ones that are legitimate ones and need to be configured and which are the ones that need to be blocked. Uh, so that those are all, all the kind of uh, uh, more details that the demo reporting can provide. Okay, thank you. Another question that's come up here is, um, did you have any difficulties getting approvals to actually implement in DMARC? So we'll go back to Pete for this one. I think the key here is education and making sure everyone knows what's happening in the organization. They understand why we're doing it and some of the things that we might want to look at with various partners. So. First thing is obviously the education piece, the knowledge, and then secondly, it's having the kind of strong um, discussions around information security versus usability. So which suppliers are allowed to send stuff on our behalf and which mail servers internally obviously we need to look at. Once you've got that, it's then a case of 
do it gradually, do it slowly, and I think it's not going to be a major issue for most people once you explain that you've got the ability to literally look at what's going on before you do anything, and then gradually increase quarantining and blocking as you go. There's obviously then having your information security people being on board, they should understand all this technology and be be willing to implement this. So if you've got InfoSec behind you, that's probably half of your um, benefits really in terms of that, that strong leadership making sure something like this happens. You will get some issues I guess with project teams that want to be able to send emails from X, Y and Z server. Um, you've got to balance that with the security and also with the time it will take to set up additional uh, SPF records, DKIM keys for them, etc, etc. You might then want to look, I guess, at alternative domains or perhaps subdomains for those suppliers and project teams. I think that will help um, with that kind of planning and control. Tony, do you have anything to add? No, we, of course we're, uh, we're only a small organisation, so the permission came from the boss, which is me. Um, <laughs> For, for us, really, this was a case of, you know, we, we work in the information security sector, so and we run an online service, and so we had to have a system that gave our customers total confidence that what they were receiving was a, was a genuine email from ourselves, and that was our main driver. Um, we were trying to protect our own brand, in fact, and I think long term, that's what DMARC's going to give us. So that, that, that was the main driver for us. Is the you know, brand protection? Thank you, Gina. I know you work with several organizations with uh, implementing DMARC. Have you heard anything from each any of those organizations in terms of difficulties of getting approvals to, to do the implementation? Yes, so there have been um, uh, polarization. That either people know about the, the protocol or are open about um, uh, understanding more about about the protocol, and they go they they find a way to move forward, or um, or is something that they haven't heard about, and being in the market, the number of uh, cybersecurity companies trying to push for the prioritizing their product and say, you know, this is the most important thing that you should care about. There are thousands of them, and the, and, and a CISO in a particular company would receive, you know, emails and calls from from a number of these organizations telling them that this is the most important thing. It's difficult for them to prioritize if they haven't heard from that before about the protocol. So. The help that um, uh, that the that the National Cybersecurity Center is doing in the UK about you know uh, uh, driving awareness in, in all the all the conferences and speaking opportunities that they have um, the the, uh, the 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 mandate indication from the Department for Homeland Security all these things are coming together uh, driving awareness of the protocol and helping people understand why this is important to do. Right, thank you. So we have a few minutes left until the end of the session. So I. Uh, not seeing any other questions that are being posted on the in the questions box. If there are any, there's this not too late. Go ahead and post those questions if you do have any questions. Uh, what we'll do right now is we'll just <laughs> give the panelists just uh, one last thought on what they feel we've either missed or haven't touched upon, and that they'd like to share with uh, the attendees. And then uh, we'll continue on with the what the the, the last slide. So uh, we'll start with um, Pete. Yeah, I think um, one thing for us is making sure that our kind of policing community, all of our police forces, talk a bit more about these things. We have got our own kind of internal national forums, so one of the things I'll be taking away from this is making sure that we've updated our um, colleagues in other police forces with our status and some of the issues that we've found. Um, hopefully we can help them get to the same level as this. Uh, I know some people in policing in the UK are actually ahead of the game, so we're probably middle of the road. Um, but we're um, obviously, although we are separate organisations, I think we should um, help each other as much as we can to try and get there quicker. Thank you. Uh, let's go with Tony next. I think there's one real thing that we haven't mentioned here. This is a free system. It's an open system. So at the basic levels, putting DMARC in isn't going to cost anything other than your own internal time and effort. Once you get to do some reporting, yes, you can go to commercial services if you wish, but if you want to do it at no charge, 
this is a free, mail, free email integrity and checking system. And there's nothing better than free. Thank you, Tony. Gina? Yes, so just to build on, on Tony's point, um, uh, there are a number of tools that, are, that make it uh, uh, easy and free for a number of particularly small organizations that need to, be, need to have this level of protection. So for example, if we're talking about a sole trader, um, uh, a, a coffee shop, you know, some uh, organizations that don't send high volume for female, they can relatively easily configure that through one of the free tools. And, and I just may mention also that there are a number of paid tools that also have three tiers for low volume uh, domains. So you can get like you know, a full, full function, full feature um, uh, product solution for free for a, for a small um, uh, email sender. Um, yeah, additional to that, it's just it's important to drive awareness on, on, on the protocol and, uh, and, and to look for you know, other opportunities for people to know what is, what, why, why this is uh, critical for, for organizations to implement. Thank you. And that actually goes on to a question, Gino, that somebody is asking. It says, can you implement DMARC without a tool or DMARC vendor? If, if it's a small domain, um, it is very easy to implement the tool um, without having, uh, uh, so, sorry, it's very easy to implement DMARC without having an additional tool. It will give you, you know, a much better visibility to have, to have a tool that will parse the reports and, and show you what is, what is going on. As soon as the organization starts getting a little bit more complicated, you get to a point where it, it, is, it will be much cheaper for your organization. So if you're talking about um, um, uh, you know, the size of a, of a small, medium-sized local council, uh, if it's gonna take you five months to get to reject mode and configure the, the 10 email sending services that you have, uh, of course it makes sense to go with a tool because you know, it won't, you, just the cost that you're gonna be paying for your IT team to be involved in that project, it will, it will be um, saved by, um, by using a, an external tool. And it will give you the visibility to keep that, um, uh, that DMARC configuration up to date um, and fully functioning at the level that it, that it should be. So I would say for small organizations, you can use a free tool or one of the paid tools that have free tiers. For a medium-sized organization to bigger, it may be easier to go with a, um, uh, with a paid solution. All right, thank you. And uh, I know it's now 8.46 a.m. Eastern, but we're going to go into overtime because there is another question which I think is relevant. Um, you know, and it would be nice to be able to provide this person with an answer to it. So the person is asking is basically gmail.com is using a DMARC policy level of none. So if Gmail doesn't use any policy or using a policy level of none, why should small organizations use DMARC? So uh, we'll, Gino, why don't you go ahead and start? Yes, so Gmail is in the process of, of, getting, of getting to reject mode um, because of the way that a number of um, uh, mailing lists and, uh, and other forwarders of email uh, work and they're still getting ready for, um, uh, for uh, being able to respond to the to, to, to requirements of the DMARC protocol. Gmail hasn't fully uh, gone there yet, but they're in the process of getting, of getting to reject um, the other thing is that they are already highlighting in the tool in, in Gmail. You can see by yourself, you know, when a, when an email has been sent, or when you have received an email from someone who is in reject mode or in quarantine mode, you can see that it goes to spam folder and why. So they're big supporters of the, of the protocol. They're just in the process of getting of getting there to that uh, uh, to that reject mode. Why a small domain should implement it? Because it is much easier for, for a domain owner to implement um, the protocol versus someone who owns like you know billions of, of, of emails. Um, and to protect that domain so, so they're the only ones who send emails from that domain and not someone else. Thank you. Tony, do you have anything to add? It, it's always easier for a small organization to do things than a, a, a global organization. Um, Gmail had exactly the same issues that everybody has. You have to start somewhere, work your way through the checks and balances, and then finally go through to the reject stage. So they've been working through this, and, and as Gino says, that they're at the point, hopefully reasonably soon, where they will turn on the rejects. Um, but for a small organization, it, it took us really about three months to get to the point of going, yes, we're, we're quite comfortable. Um, that everything's locked down. Um, we're 
we're really capturing things. Um, for larger organizations, it may take six to nine months, especially if they've got lots and lots of mail servers and, and mail senders or third parties sending on behalf. But for a smaller organization, um, you should be able to get through the process within the 90 days. Now there's your challenge. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I'm not seeing any more questions and answer, and we are a little bit over, so we're just going to, I'm going to move on to the next slide. And it's just basically providing you some additional information about the 90-day challenge at, at the Global Cyber Alliance. So we do have another panel session this afternoon at 1 p.m. Eastern time, so if you'd like to reattend, feel free to do so. Uh, we'll have the same panelists, subsect for Pete. Pete uh, will, uh, Chris Gunnerman from Internet Society is going to be uh, attending that one as opposed to Pete. Uh, we also, on December 13th, we're going to have a webinar about DMARC and how to get started. So we'll talk about the what things you need to take into account, the things you need to take the plan for, and items to consider before actually going through the implementation process. Then on December 20th, we have our GCA monthly webinar, which we've been doing for the past year. Uh, it's a DMARC tour. This is an hour-long uh, session that's going to go basically through everything about DMARC from what it is, what's necessary, what the record looks like, and the reporting capabilities. Uh, some other additional resources that are available to you. So for, again, to keep up to date with the 90-day challenge, if you go to the site that's listed there, you can sign up, you get emails about all these webinars that are coming up so that way you know when to register and when the registration links are available, and also the information that we're going to provide in terms of guides and links to other information. Also, DMARC partner offers. So majority of our DMARC partner, vendor partners, have provided 90-day free services uh, during this, uh, this challenge. So if you have signed up for the 90-day challenge, you are able to take advantage of these uh, partner offers as well. So I'd like to thank everyone who joined. Uh, our email address is right there, gca-dmark at globalcyberalliance.org. If you have any questions at all that you weren't able to ask or think of afterwards, after this uh, panel, feel free to send an email here. If you do have questions directly, post to any of the panelists as well. Just email this address and we will get those questions to uh, each of the panelists. As I said, uh, we actually do have one more question. So if the panelists are willing to take one more question, um, we, can, we can keep going. <laughs> Do you know, Tony, are you okay with one more question? Yep. Yes, I am. That's a, it's a, so basically the question is, is what is your recommended DMARC record should look like? Um, well, at the beginning, it's going to be a pass um, 100%. Um, and then also that you've got to set your... Um, records to where you're going to send your reporting so that it's the, the DMARC record is made of several blocks so right at the beginning you are going to be in pass mode. Once you're comfortable that all of the information you're capturing everything and your records are being recorded you know you know where you are then move that pass into quarantine and then quarantine yourself up step by step as Pete mentioned earlier, you'd make yourself 10% 10, 10 to begin with, work your way up, keep that tracking going on. Um, eventually, you'll end up with 100% quarantining. And really, once you're at 100% quarantining, you're ready to go to the reject mode. Um, so DMARC records are really easy to set up. I, I used an online tool to set up mine. In fact, I started off with the Global Cyber Alliance page and worked my way from there. Uh, so that's a really good place to start setting your DMARC records. Yeah. And yeah. we will be covering more of this in the, in the next session uh, in January. And if you um, go to, if you attend the December 20th webinar, we'll actually give you what DMARC record will look like and one that you, may, you should consider starting with. Uh, Gino, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think uh, I think that setting up your DMARC record is one of the one of the easiest parts of the process. So you can start receiving reports um, as part of the 90-day um, trial. You can look into into a number of the of the of the current vendors that are part of the program. We we particularly um, uh, work directly with on DMARC, and that will give you your your record, and you will be able to see the reports directly from from the tool. All right. Thank you, Gino.
All right, so we went a little bit over. So at this point, uh, again, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, the email address you see here, you can email at any point in time. We will take your questions and help you and assist you in any way that we can here at Global Cyber Alliance. We'll also redirect any questions you have for the panelists uh, for you as well. So again, thank you everyone for joining the webinar.